thank you everybody here at UGA for organizing this symposium and having me as your speaker. Um, and as Jesse said, I'm not new to UGA. And thanks again for training all the wonderful students and sending <laughs> our way. <laughs> so, so we are happy to be here. And thanks again, Simon, who has laid the foundation for my talk, because we were talking all the basic research stuff in the morning. And we, were, um, we, we just want to, at least myself and my boss, Patrick, is here. We want to bring the public health side of things uh, in the context of malaria. I think the really the touching story that Simon was trying to bring out was to really highlight you know, how bad the malaria is for the people. Because it's easy for us. So, that's why whenever who comes to work with me in the lab, especially who are from the US, I always tell them you should first go to the malaria endemic countries and see what people are, uh, you know, what malaria means and what real world problem. Then you will have a better idea of what you want to do scientifically in terms of addressing the problem. So, so what I'm going to talk to you about today is, you know, the, some of the challenges that we have for the diagnostic. I mean, what we have at this moment and what are the challenges uh, and also uh, what are the challenges we are facing for the resistance and what, we, uh, what kind of tools we are trying to develop for, uh, you know, fighting resistance. <coughs> and um, with that background, first I want to talk to you about the diagnostic tools and then switch over to the uh, resistance issue. Um, you know, at least classically, the malaria was, you know, even before uh, malaria parasites were invented, people knew there is something as malaria, and it used to be diagnosed clinically based on the fever. And, uh, and then, of course, the discovery of the malaria parasites led to use of the microscopic <coughs> tools, which is the, still the most commonly used uh, tool for in, in many places. And, uh, and then recently, um, we started using what we call it as rapid diagnostic tests or RDTs, um, and then also the molecular tools also play uh, some important role in terms of malaria parasite detection and uh, diagnosis, which I will talk about, and as well as uh, serology, this is more relevant for the US kind of setting. This is not very commonly used to diagnostic tool, but it could be used in, to, to some extent, their exposure. Um, so the microscopy was oldest diagnostic tool that was used for uh, you know, malaria diagnosis. Uh, I would say still it's one of the uh, gold sort of standard for the laboratory confirmation. And then the way it is uh, diagnosed typically is they make two smears. Uh, what they call it is a thick smear that is shown here as well as the thin smear. The thick smear allows you to quickly see uh, whether malaria parasites are there, once you see that, then you can go to the thin smear, try to speciate them much better with the uh, thin smear. And then, so this is how you, uh, you typically see for the falciform malaria, since they all sequester, you typically see more like rings. And uh, this kind of uh, sky sands you don't see for malaria, but for other parasites, this is one of the cultured parasites. So, Again, the, um, these smears are stained with GEMSA, which is what uh, commonly WHO recommends, but there are other kinds of stains people use as well. And one of the challenge with the microscopy is, although it's a simple tool, still you need a microscope, still you need a power to run the microscope, and you need a, some kind of a, at least small laboratory setting and trained people, and it's a laborious task for somebody from the morning to evening to go through the smears and hundreds of slides, it's a daunting task. And then when it comes to the speciation, there are always difficult to sometimes, unless you're an expert microscopy, to correctly speciate them. So recently we started moving towards RDT. Another problem is in Africa, most of the malaria occurs in the community settings where, as Simon was pointing out, there is no lab for miles you have to go in order to find a hospital. So in those settings, what you do? Um, so that's where I think uh, the RDT became an important thing. And also recently, WHO changed the policy you know, in the past, it used to be anybody who has a fever, symptom-based treatment for malaria, because the malaria is still the number one cause for morbidity in Africa in many parts. So anybody has who fever, since the diagnosis was a challenge, they were all treated with anti-malarial drugs. 
But as you know, it was probably okay when they had a chloroquine, which was cheaper and it was effective. But once we got more expensive drugs now, and also the people realize uh, you, you need to be judicious about using these drugs, otherwise you are promoting the development of drug resistance. So they decided to come up with a policy to do the treatment based on the evidence of the presence of malaria parasites. So since WHO adopted that policy, there has been a shift towards using the, um, sorry, the, uh, the, the diagnostic test. So, so that's how since 2006, uh, 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 recently 2011, the policy changes. There is a lot more use of these tests. So basically, the, right now we have uh, RDTs which are based upon deduction of three different you know, malaria parasite antigens or enzymes. The histidine-rich protein or HRP2 is the one most commonly used to test um, and, and then the lactose dehydrogenase is another target, then aldolase is another enzyme which is another target. I will talk a little bit more about them. And here again you see how it is done. You take a drop of blood and drop it in here. It's an immunochromatography test. You can see the specific mass for the diagnosis. So let me just talk to you about what are the advantages, limitations and challenges of these tests. The HRB based tests are uh, best species specific test because this uh, only falciform malaria parasites make the HRP2 antigens. The genes for HRP2 is absent in other malaria parasites. So if somebody is positive for HRP2, we can clearly say so they got a falciform malaria. So that's one, ad one advantage. And that is, it's a highly sensitive com among all the RDTs because there is a lot of this antigen produced and it is plenty available in the, in the plasma as well. And because of that, it can also provide false positive test results uh, because HRP2 parasites linger in the blood for longer time, even the parasites are removed. So, so sometimes um, few false positives can be uh, also happening. Uh, and then recently, um, uh, you know, we have come, up, uh, come across uh, the deletion of the HRP2 gene in, uh, in the South American population that was observed originally when you know, Dr. John Bonwell in the malaria branch who does the evaluation of RDTs during that investigation. He was, uh, he in collaboration with WHO creating malaria parasites bank from different parts. So at that time they accidentally discovered there is a population of parasites in Peru that they have naturally deleted HRP2 antigen. Until then we thought or at least, at least in the academic community, all these parasites uh, do, uh, this, this, this protein is sort of essential for the parasite. And, and then of course, um, uh, you know, this has been found uh, at very low level in some other populations as well. This slide just gives you an idea of what is the prevalence. We did a molecular surveillance study to f determine how extensive this deletion is. And uh, thanks again for Sheila and uh, uh, um, uh, Luciana who are here who participated in the project. As you can see here in, in Guyana we didn't see much whereas uh, in Suriname we saw 14 percent whereas in Brazil overall in the country 15 percent but within Brazil we see different regional differences in some parts no deletion but when you come to this region up to 30 percent deletion in the Amazon and then again in Peru which had the um, uh, anywhere from 30, 40 percent, in some sites even 80 percent of deletion. And then in Bolivia also we saw, again with the limited number, uh, low level of deletion. And in, in Colombia, in the Amazon part here again up to 50, 60 percent deletion has been found when you come to the coastal region where a lot of malaria is, even there low level of, uh, you know, the deletion. So which sort of highlights the challenges for using RDT, at least in some setting. Thank God it is not in Africa very much, although there are some reports showing very low level. Let's hope it's not spreading, but the concern is since we are using a lot now the RDT, HRP2 RDT in the African setting, even the few percentage of negative parasites have the potential to get selected again. So that's why it's important to keep up the surveillance and monitoring for that. So 
coming back to the other test, the LDH based test, it's, it's, it's a nice test, the, the, but the only issue is it is very good as a pan test at the genus level detection is very good, but we don't have many tests that can clearly differentiate species. People normally use this in combination with HRP2 because the reason is that LDH is such a highly conserved enzyme, there is a very few differences between the proteins of the different species, so people haven't got a lot of good antibodies, monoclonals that can differentiate these different strains of parasites so because of that uh, but it's it's important to understand the specific uh, the which species it comes from since there are differences in the way we treat them and all that so although companies are trying to make some better ones but uh, but there are they are very few and aldolase is a poor test I would say it has a lower sensitivity as well as lower specificity at best it's a genus level specific test and just I would like to acknowledge here again, you know, just to bring the point here, the CDC does, uh, the, our kind of work involves a lot of public health impact. Um, so when the RDT was introduced, there was a lot of challenges about the quality because there was no way of telling which test works better or good. So that's where the WHO came up with an idea of really assuring the, you know, the quality assurance of this test. And then they established a quality assessment program and then they, uh, uh, so they gave that responsibility to CDC. Dr. John Bonwell leads that effort. So idea is now every uh, product that is submitted to this collaboration is evaluated at CDC and they have published these results. At least four uh, rounds of testing have been published. All these results are open uh, in the WHO website. Now they est established a criteria that the test have to be at, at certain you know, meet certain standards before it is purchased through the programs and other means. So once they started doing that, the quality of the test itself went up because before there was no nobody policing what is the uh, how the standard should be. But it definitely helped. John is right now doing the uh, the fifth round of testing, um, and then uh, so the. Uh, so, so I sort of highlighted you some of the issues that we are facing with RDT. So the question is, okay, what is the next generation of RDT that we can come up with? Um, here again, you, there are always limited funding for people like you who are in the university setting to really come up with, uh, uh, you know, if you look at how many NIH grants are given to people who want to work on developing a diagnostic test, <laughs> and <laughs> the answer is, you know, near zero. <laughs> um, so, uh, so, so that's one of the reason why there are challenges. So all those three tests, it was just reagents were already there. The um, people just put together those tests and made it. But there is no concerted effort to come up with just like they work for a vaccine or a drug, a program to support an, a, a diagnostic test. So, so our laboratory uh, is trying to focus on this issue and we have uh, established quite a number of collaborations to really come up with the next generation test. I just want to highlight some of them here. Uh, we are working with uh, Dr. Suri Iyer in uh, Georgia State University um, in developing more carbohydrate-based ligands as capture molecule. He is an, ex uh, he is an expert and he has uh, pioneered in this area and developed tests for other organisms which our FDA is happy about it and his uh, folks are here, Suri couldn't be, uh, make it here, I wanted him to be here, um, both Yoon and others are here. And then we are also trying to explore collaboration with Vasanth, we already had several discussions with uh, Vasanth about you know, trying to use some of the targets that he's working on as a potential candidate uh, uh, for diagnostic purpose and, uh, and I have Kelly here, she's a new bioinformatics fellow so we want to really use bioinformatic approach also like what uh, Jesse and we have been doing for the, for the genetic targets uh, in terms of developing. Jesse, we will still need your help and all the Plasmodi database you maintain here is a wonderful resource for that kind of purpose because we have all the basic science knowledge now that we can really take advantage for the public health purpose. Um, and then the molecular tools, uh, which are, uh, you know, nucleic-based assays, these, these tests are not for primary diagnosis of malaria, but they are more used in the confirm as a confirmatory diagnostic tool, especially in the reference lab settings. Of course, there are different kinds of PCR methods that exist. And then 
these methods are also becoming much more relevant in the context of uh, you know, field use uh, for the malaria control and elimination purposes in terms of identifying submicroscopic infection because this serves as a reservoir of transmission. So people are now trying to in the elimination program map out where the transmission force is, where there seems to be need for uh, such a molecular tools and other special situations like outbreak investigation and others. Uh, and also the, the PCR was very useful in identifying nalsei and other zoonotic parasites um, because the conventional uh, the diagnostic tools were not helpful in clearly diagnosing nalsei. So, so PCR test is essential to really identify something like nalsei. So, so what are the innovations? Um, you know, as I just pointed out and uh, um, Jesse mentioned, we actually we got a support through CDC UGA collaborative grant that allowed us to really use the you know we have the genome database people were just using for more than 30 years um, 18s RNA gene as a target when I call Jesse Jesse we need, can we really apply for this we can come up with this idea she didn't believe that people haven't come up with a, another candidate and then she herself did a literature search and called me and said yes you're right so let's do that it, it really helped us to identify you know with her help and the team here some novel candidates which has allowed us to develop some additional molecular tools and uh, uh, we have published uh, in, uh, at least three, four papers to highlighting some of the new targets and they are definitely useful. Um, and then one of other other focus of our lab again is for public health need purposes. We want to develop molecular tools that can be more mobile, that can be used in the point of care setting. Um, and then other tools for the high throughput screening that are much more simpler than what we are currently using. So recently, we, we, Naomi has published a paper on this PET PCR, which is not more simpler to use it in the field. And just to highlight, you know, the LAMP technology is one of the simplest one that can be performed. It was, uh, you know, discovered by Japanese scientists uh, uh, from the ICANN company. You know, this works that at one single temperature, uh, so it's an isothermal PCR. So because of that, it can be easily done even using a water bath. That, that's, that's how they did it. And then the end point is you look for the precipitate. So this is fine in a, in a research setting, but when you are deploying such kind of tools in the field, you want to have it in a much more simpler way uh, and also have an objective end point so that it's easy to tell whether it's a positive or negative. So in that context, that's where like Naomi worked on developing this tool um, uh, using a tube scanner, what we call it as a, a company in Germany developed this instrumentation, which is now acquired by the Kaijin here. But we worked with them in some sort of, uh, you know, uh, figuring out some of these things. And then the advantage here is you have like a tube holder, you can put it, it has a thermocycler, you know, capability, and then when you hook onto your computer, you can actually really see, you know, this is the background control, uh, not DNA template control, but when you have the DNA, you can quickly see within like uh, 30 minutes uh, specific amplification of the DNA. You can monitor this in real time. That's why call, we call it as a real amp. And it's kind of objective. And also you can program it in the, in the machine itself to, you know, record the results. And it has, uh, can be, it's smaller than a laptop, so you can, you know, it's portable. Uh, so, um, and then also it has Bluetooth capability. You can record, report the results even for your manager sitting somewhere else. Um, so, sorry. So now I'm going to uh, talk to you about the challenges we are facing due to antimalarial drugs. Uh, and this slide I just want to use to highlight, you know, in 1960s, you know, chloroquine was introduced uh, sometime immediately after um, the World War II. Again, in the World War II, a lot of people died of malaria. The, so that was the one of the reasons why there was so much of focus of developing the anti-malarial drugs. So the chloroquine came out of that from Germany. And at the time, you can see if all the blue shows all the malaria endemic areas where chloroquine was still working. But even at the time, there was two foci emerging internationally where the, the resistance was evolving. And even now, for unknown reason, um, we still have these, these regions seems to be the uh, areas where the resistance seems to first pop up. Uh, and then from there, uh, spread to other, other regions of the world. And you can see by 2004, this map completely turned red. 
the only areas the chloroquine still work is Central America. We still don't understand um, because the resistant parasites from Southeast Asia jump to Africa, and that's that's how the resistant spread. And uh, but it is still uh, quite a mystery. But from public health standpoint, which is good, the Central American countries the chloroquine still works, and uh, it is it is very helpful for them. So how do you monitor the drug resistance? And uh, classically. I, I, we have at least three different tools. Out of them, the in vivo drug efficacy trial is still the gold standard, and the WHO would like to make the policy change only based upon the in vivo drug efficacy trial. Like they set up a cutoff, okay, if there is a, a early on it used to be 20 or 25 percent, but now if, if, some, if there is a 10 percent failure, then the drug will be switched. Then the in vitro drug sensitivity, this more like a research tool and also a complementary tool to monitor. Um, so, But since it's a very labor and resource intensive, it is hard to implement in many places. Only the research lab tried to do this. And then, of course, the molecular surveillance is becoming an important tool to really uh, quickly map out what's happening in the population. Because doing the in vivo drug efficacy trial is very, very expensive, and it takes a lot of money. So if you want to, and also you have only, you know, maybe 100 people uh, enrolled in a trial, it doesn't give you an idea of how extensive the resistant parasites are in the population. So that's where the molecule tool sort of gives you an idea to map that out. Uh, <coughs> So just to give you a quick idea that, for, for, for example, uh, there are markers available for several uh, um, uh, drugs for chloroquine. It is the PFCRT gene, the mutations in a couple of places, particularly the K76T mutation is critical um, for the resistance. And then so one can use these markers uh, to really identify the resistant parasite population. The same way for sulfadoxin, paramethamine, mefloquine, all these highlighted in blue shows those are uh, some of the well characterized markers. So this is how then you use the molecular tools to really map out. Um, and then another tool in that context that's quite useful is the uh, microsatellites. Uh, I don't have to introduce you what microsatellites are. They are classical genetic tools that has always been used for you know, population-based genetic studies. And these tools are also quite useful for us to understand and track how the resistant parasites are evolving and spreading. Like, for example, if this is the target gene, then you also map the the microsatellite profile around the, the neighboring gene, and then you can sort of, uh, since the resistant alleles help to spread the, you know, the, the population, the population, uh, you, can, you can really sort of try to get an idea of, uh, you know, how these parasite uh, uh, spread in the population. So using such a kind of microsatellites, only um, people really proved, in a, uh, Wooten and others from NIH initially used these tools to show that indeed, the, the, the founder populations for the resistance were only like four or five, two from South America, that population spread here, and then from the Southeast Asia, this CVIET genotype originally evolved here and spread to Africa and spread. So that's how using the microsatellite tools, this has been understood. <coughs> so now, uh, because chloroquine, uh, Chloroquine was used for the longest time. Then after that, SP was introduced. Then quickly, resistance developed to SP also. And then that's where the combination therapy was developed. So what is the <coughs> idea of the combination therapy? So the use combination of drugs, uh, because uh, the monotherapy is quickly failing. And, and it is well known for the, you know, HIV, TB, and cancer. They use combine more than one drug, so that seems to be one of the strategy by which they are trying to manage the resistant issue. So the same way, then that's how the malaria communi community also started adapting this concept of uh, using the combination therapy. That is improved treatment efficacy, and also the, our hope was when we introduced the artemisinin combination therapy, it will uh, you know at least slow down the development of resistant. But uh, uh, so. So the why they use uh, the artemisinin based combination therapy, uh, the idea here is, or the theory here is, you combine a long-acting drug, such as sulfadoxin, paramethamine, or mefloquine. These are long-acting drugs. Otherwise, their half-life is longer. They stay in the system longer. That means they can act on the parasites for a longer period of time. And then you combine that um, along with artemisinin. Artemisinin is a uh, you know drug. Again, this was uh, the, the impetus for discovering artemisinin was Vietnam War. 
Um, uh, so that's how the artemisinin was uh, discovered because all the Vietnamese were uh, North Vietnamese were dying, and they went to Chinese president and asked him to help them. And that's how then they started a secret project, what call it S523 project. And so that's what led to the discovery of uh, artemisinin. They, he assembled all the Chinese scientists, about 500 of them, to assemble all the labs uh, to work on the uh, anti-malarial drugs. And uh, so they went back to their uh, traditional. Uh, medical literature and then pulled out all the herbs that were uh, whatever was indicated for fever and that's how they they finally came up with uh, artemisinin. So this artemisinin, uh, one interesting aspect it is it's a very short living drug. It's uh, short life is very very short less than an hour. So that means it quickly is disappears from the system. That's why when you use the artemisinin, what you do, you are actually trying to reduce the biomass. Uh, so, but you still have a quite a bit of parasites still lingering in the system. So you have these long-acting drugs, which helps to eliminate the rest of the load. So uh, the idea here is since the artemisinin helps, since it's a hard laugh, short half-life, people thought it wouldn't induce so much of resistance because always we scientifically thought you need to have the drug persisting for a long time and then that kind of helps to select the resistant parasites and then use the, um, you know, with the long component you do that. But, but, but in actuality what happened was although in 1971 they started testing this drug, only around 2000 um, the combination th therapy was uh, introduced uh, in, for the first time in the world uh, uh, the artemisinin combination therapy was introduced in uh, Southeast Asia, in Thailand, in the Cambodia and um, to our surprise uh, by 2008 and 9 we started seeing uh, the uh, you know s indications that probably there are some changes happening in terms of the use of this combination therapy what happened was uh, you know unlike the classical resistance we talk about when we talk about the artemisinin resistant the first sign of failure of the, that that drug came from slow cl clearance or delayed clearance what they call it as uh, that means it takes uh, uh, more than two days, uh, but by day three, if they are still positive, with, that's what we are calling it as an artemisinin resistance. Um, so, um, if you look at this map here, you see Thailand and Cambodia, and this is a, um, a study which shows, you know, in what are the sites you have the clearance time more than day three, then you can see the more dark intensity of the redness, like in Cambodia and some Thai regions, you already have a lot of parasites. Uh, here you can see up to 20 to 40 percent of parasites having showing the slow clearance rate. Still, when you talk about the clinical resistance, even in this setting, still when you use the combination therapy, there seems to be working. But uh, over the time, the fear is it, it will become useless. Um, so just I want to highlight uh, this is a slide I borrowed from Tim Anderson. This is, this is how when you don't have any sort of resistance, this is a fast clearance within 48 hours, all the parasites are clear when you use artemisinin or artemisinin combination therapy. But when you have the resistance, so you can see that curve is shifted here. It takes day, more than days. So this is a quick uh, sort of a phenotype to understand what's going on uh, in terms of the resistance to artemisinin. So again, um, people are trying to, from a research lab, identify molecular markers so that it will be easy for the surveillance programs. And this is some of the work from Tim Anderson's group. And then this is from Chris Plaw's work. They identified candidates mapping to somewhere around chromosome 13, but they couldn't specifically tell which particular gene target was. And then it was just the recent paper, I'm sure some of you might have read it, Harry et al. Um, that was published in Nature, they precisely pointed out a particular gene and a couple of uh, you know, mutations associated with it. And that's what it is. So the, interestingly, that protein tends out to be, it has a, what they call it as a CULS13 uh, propeller domain. And, uh, and, and this uh, gene, of course, is not unique to falciparum. It is present from virus to human beings. It's a highly conserved, it looks like uh, um, we don't know what it exactly does in malaria parasites, but uh, at least uh, we know in the humans it plays a role in oxidative stress response. Maybe artemisinin, people believe, works in this pathway, so there seems to be some connection, but, uh, but nobody has formally proven that. Um, and also it is involved in human-human interaction. 
So here again, thanks Eldin. Eldin has come to us from here um, morning. Um, we had from David a uh, lot of reference. So this is his bioinformatics skill. He made this uh, picture to indicate where this, he was trying to map where these mutations are. So the C580, the cysteine changes to tyrosine. When it changes, there is a change in the charge. That's what we are trying to come up with from this modeling. That's the same thing is happening in other residues that have been indicated. So uh, Eldin's project is one of that is to really trying to work out and develop tools for surveillance. Uh, so this slide again from the Nature paper, uh, what this points out is, okay, the, as I said, there are several SNPs, but this C58Y seems to be the most common one at this time. So in, as you can see here in Palin, um, you know, this, uh, you, you see a lot of them, and in the other sites also, you have in the Western Cambodia, a lot of red, uh, and then the other, other ones, the wild type is the green one, when you go to the Eastern Cambodia, not much, that has been the historically the case. So, so the, the, the point is, at least we have a tool that we could potentially use for the surveillance purposes. So what we are trying to do with that tool, so of course, we need to validate the use of this tool in different settings because historically there have been slightly different patterns, although the same genes have been used. So we are trying to do that and also develop these tools in a form that could be used in the field because the surveillance needs to be local. We should not be doing surveillance sitting in Atlanta. The, the tools need to be in the countries if we need to effectively use them. And then the, this is critical to supporting the prevention efforts in terms of preventing the, uh, the spread of resistance and containing that. And also I would like to finally thank my <laughs> colleagues who only make our life. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so Ira, our lab manager's uh, creative idea, this is, is, is quite creative. Again, Ira was also UGA product and uh, he is the one who makes sure our labs runs properly. <laughs> and <laughs> And thank you again for your attention. <laughs> and, and by the way, not all of them are here. And I have several of them here, Mary, Sarah, and uh, several others soon. Uh, OK, just as a reminder to the students, we know you need to come and go for classes, and that's perfectly fine. We have time for a couple of questions. I'm going to invite Mary to come and hook her computer up while we're doing that. Questions for Kumar? Um, what, what do you think is responsible for so much deletion in Peru? We saw that 33% deletion of that singular uh, Right, right. I mean, um, good question. Uh, we, we are trying to understand that. One thing we found, there, so the first step, Sheila Kini, she's a postdoc in our lab. She's trying to answer this question. One thing she found was uh, the first thing we wanted to figure out was whether it was a single origin that led to the spread of the parasites or it is a multiple event because most of the drug resistance are very few origins and then they spread. But when we looked at um, for this in the Peruvian population, clearly there were only like five clonal population in the Peru. Out of that, four clonal populations had this deletion, and when we using the microsatellites look out, look for their background, they were all totally independent from each other. So it is not a rare event that has led to the spread that seems to have occurred in, in at least a majority of the population that exists, so we don't know why. And it looks like this deletion is not just in that gene. When you look at it, this deletion extends to about 20 KB region around that. Um, so we really don't know. So we are, we are trying to understand what's happening. Is, is it something specific to HRP2? It doesn't look like that. It just happens to be in that region. So it looks like there is the chunks of uh, portions of plasmodium, at least the falciform genes, seem to be dilating. So what's going on? There is a big question. I'm sure that kind of things are highly relevant for people here to really understand the biology of this parasite and what may be going on. And, Jonathan, uh, good to see you. You're here. <laughs> yes, uh, I just uh, wondered, uh, what's the situation in Africa? Is, is it, uh, no, they have done some papers. It's not a lot there. There was one paper which uh, looked at, and it seems to be in a very, very low percentage. But, uh, but we need to be vigilant in Africa, because we are, that's where we are using RDT, not in South America. South America, they still use the microscopy, luckily, uh, because of the infrastructure and everything. So, so definitely, that's an important question. I, 
I think there was another question there back someone wanted to talk. Well, I was just curious, you showed a few different mutations. Have you correlated the, the, the genotype with, with differences in genotype in terms of levels of resistance? You, you mean for the artemisinin in resistant? For the artemisinin in resistance, yeah. I guess. Okay. I mean, that work was just published, and they have actually in the Nature paper, they have tried to uh, do that work. So they have indeed have demonstrated that uh, there is a big difference in the clearance times as well as other they have done some sophisticated math and looked at other, other parameters as well. So clearly there seems to be some correlation between those mutations and their clearance, yes.